Hey guys, thanks for joining Learn to Play. My name is Lance, and today we're going to look at Journey Wrath of the Demons by Morrow Productions. It's a one to four player game that's fully cooperative, and it takes roughly between a half an hour to about two hours, depending upon the quest you choose to play. It can be played in a full campaign where the missions will link together and it'll tell a story. So in the game, the players will take on the roles of the four different pilgrims on their quest to save the world and to close the demon gates. So let's head to the table and I'll teach you how to play. Alright, so we're going to take a look at an example of a character sheet. So this is the Monkey King. At the top of the card, it's going to list his health. And as he loses health, we'll move that gauge down. In the middle of the card, it's going to list the dice that he's going to get to roll when he performs an attack, the dice he gets when he rolls defense, the dice he gets when he does a cleansing roll, and his basic movement value. At the bottom middle of the card, we, we have his chi, which is always set to 10 at the beginning of the game. And he can use that on some of his skill cards to pay the cost that they have to play them. And on the end of his card, we have his good karma, which as he accrues that, he can spend it on two different abilities. And then the bad karma, which once it hits 10, you have to spend it, and it'll give you one corruption card, and it'll upgrade your weapon. So with that, the next thing you need is your weapon cards, and you'll select the level 1 weapon. And with this, it's going to tell you when you roll the white dice for your attack, you're going to consult this chart here and it'll tell you the amount of damage that you do with the white dice. You're also going to need to grab your character skill cards. And there's two different types of skill cards. You have the cards that are retained when they're used, so you'll get to use them over and over again. And then you have the discard immediately cards, so when you use those, they're one use only, and they'll get discarded when you use them. And then the last thing you'll want to do is grab your character. And then we're going to go over his attack range. So let's go ahead and bring a map tile in here. So if we put our character on the map tile facing forward, which is what it shows here, he can hit monsters two spaces on either side of him, two spaces behind him, and two spaces in front of him. And he can choose one target that lies within that arc and hit them. So with these cards, when a pilgrim gets a condition, you'll place the card next to the pilgrim's sheet, and during the end of turn phase, you're going to add a turn token to any of the condition cards that you have active. And then during the maintenance phase of the following turn, you're going to consult these cards, and you're going to check the duration. If there isn't enough tokens to equal the duration on the card, then the Pilgrim is going to take the effect of the card. So if we look at the Burns, for example, it lasts for two turns, and right now we only have one turn token on it, so the Pilgrim is going to take two health points of damage, and then he can, will proceed through our turn, and then yet again at the end of turn phase, then he would re this token would receive a second counter, and so during that following maintenance phase, then that hero would remove the card completely because it meets the requirements of having two duration tokens on it. All right, so the next thing we're going to go over is setup. So go ahead and grab the main rule book, and you're going to choose one of the missions that you'd like to go on. From there, you're just going to set out the tiles and put out all the stuff you need, and it'll give you a listing of all the different items you'll need for that particular mission or quest. And then go ahead and read through the uh, quest-specific rules and the victory conditions so you know what you're doing. From there, then you're going to go ahead and shuffle and set out your fortune and misfortune decks your corruption deck your turn and initiative tokens your four different status effects your karma wheel your demon spawning deck and in some missions that deck may be modified so make sure you check with the quest that you're on to determine what you need to put in that deck and your different dice now with journey wrath of the demon you're going to play all the quests, you're going to play all four pilgrims. So even if you're playing with less than four players, some players at that point may be playing with more than one pilgrim. And then go ahead and set out all the monsters you're going to need for that particular quest. 
All right, so the last thing we need to do in this quest is with our villagers, it says to stack five turn tokens on them. So we went ahead and added one of each of the, of the tokens and then I flipped over another four because there's no five number. So we just flipped it over and added it to the stack. So we have five turn tokens on that. And then we have to assign initiative to each one of our pilgrims. So we'll grab one more of each of these. And we'll go ahead and mix them up and give them out to each one of our pilgrims. So Cho is going to be fourth. The demon or the monkey king is going to be second. Trip will be third. And our monk will be first. From there, each quest in Journey Wrath of the Demons is played in a number of turns, and each turn has four different phases. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at each one of those phases in more detail. So the first phase that we're going to look at is the maintenance phase. And with the maintenance phase, each player should examine their active cards to see if anything needs to be updated. And then they're also going to check time limits on some of their cards and effects. So like we talked about earlier with the status effect cards, this is when we'll check to see if we have enough turn tokens on them to discard them. And then another example is in our first quest that we're on right now. During the maintenance phase, we're going to check and see if the villagers have any uh, turn tokens on them left. If they don't, as it says in the quest book, we will replace the villagers with one of the, the bull warriors. All right, so the next phase we're going to look at is the pilgrim phase. During the Pilgrim phase, each pilgr Pilgrim is going to be activated based on the initiative tokens that we assign them during setup. And then when each Pilgrim gets activated, they have two action points that they can spend on different actions that they can perform. Some cards will allow them to have more uh, action points. And then let's go ahead and take a look at the different actions they can perform, starting with movement. Alright, so we're going to go ahead and take a look at a couple of examples of movement here. So a couple things to note. In Journey Wrath of the Demon, no model can move diagonally. All models must move orthogonally. Models facing is very important and they can only move in the direction that they're facing. So let's go ahead and look at, take a look at an example of movement with the monk who has a base size of two squares. So for one point of action, he can move up to three squares. So let's go ahead and take a look at a couple examples. So he has three movement points, so he can spend those to go one, two, three spaces forward. Now, with the pilgrims that have the wider base or monsters, if they wish to turn, they can turn up to 90 degrees for one point of their movement. And to do that, they have to rotate their base and have their base has to stay on one of the squares that they started on. So one point would turn. So if he wanted to turn again, he could do this. And then he has one point left, so he could move forward from there. Uh, other models cannot move through models. So if the Monkey King was behind our monk, he could not move through him. He has to move around him, so he would have to spend his points to turn, move forward, turn, and then he can move forward again. And these rules apply to the monsters as well. Now you'll also notice that on some of the tiles they have different colored lines that are surrounding different structures. So with the green lines, those are supports. So if a character is on a support when he gets attacked, or any model that rolls defensive dice, they receive plus one to the defensive roll. A couple other things that we're going to look at are on some of the on some of the tiles. You're going to have purple lines, and in those spaces, no model can ever be moved into those spaces by any condition or effect. Those are completely impassable. The next tile that we have has uh, a fire, which is the red circle or the red lines around it. Anytime a pilgrim moves into a space that has red lines around it, they receive one point of damage for every space that they move into or turn on. 
And if they're stationary and remain in that space through their turn, they will also receive a point of damage. The next thing we're going to look at is the yellow lines. And those are for buildings, and so those are you cannot move past. So the last type we're going to look at is water, which is also going to only affect the pilgrims. So with water, it's going to slow the pilgrims down, and they have to spend two of their movement points to move one space or to turn one space. Now with water, the pilgrims are allowed to use both of their actions to combine a movement, in which case then they would return to their normal movements of whatever their value is. And in this way, it allows the pilgrims to move a little bit farther than if they were trying to do it with separate move actions. So if we were to look at an example real quick, with Monk Sha, he has three movement points for a single action, so he could only move one space because you have to have enough movement points to complete a full move in order to do it. But if he used both of his actions to do a movement, he could move up to three spaces, or he could do uh, a turn and move up to two spaces. All right, so here we have a couple of examples of a couple demons that you guys might be facing throughout your quests. So at the top of the card, we have the demon's name, and then we have the karma wheel on the side, both good karma and bad karma, which we'll cover a little bit more when we get into combat. We have the demon's movement value, his hit points, and his soul power, which both of those we will also cover in combat. When the demon doesn't attack, he will roll his dice that are listed on his card. And then as you can see with some of the bigger demons, they also get the black demon dice. So that dice works just like the hero's white dice in that the demons would consult their skull track at the bottom of their card when they roll that card, that dice, to determine what they get to do with it. And then the demons also have their attack range just like the heroes. It works the same way except for with the demons. Most of the demons, they get to attack all the targets that lie within their attack range. So we're going to go ahead and put a demon out on the field. And then I'm going to go ahead and move the Monkey King's chart over so you can see that. And the demon card. So let's go ahead and activate the Monkey King. So for his first action, he's going to go ahead and move. And he can move up to four squares. So one, two, three. And his range is two, so he can still hit the demon there. So he doesn't have to move up that last point if he doesn't want to. For his second action, he's going to go ahead and perform an attack. And so before he rolls his dice, he can activate any of his skill cards or any other cards that might augment his attack. From here, we're going to go ahead and roll our two reds and our white dice for our attack. And so we rolled four points of damage from our reds. And then our white, we rolled a one, so we'll consult our weapon. And on a roll of a one, we, we do one damage. So we've done five damage total. So we look at our demon's hit points, which is only two. So we've done more than enough to, to hit him and cause a wound. When we roll on uh, to hit him, we have to roll a two or better total. So we're well over that. So from here, we have two choices. We can either kill the demon outright and take two bad karma points, or we can attempt a cleansing ritual where we will roll our white dice and if we roll equal to or greater than his soul power, we will cleanse him. So let's go ahead and try that. So we did roll a one. So the demon has been cleansed, so he will be removed and we will receive two good karma points on our karma wheel. If we would have failed that roll by rolling an X on the dice, then the entire attack will have been nullified and that demon will not be removed. Alright, so now that we've gone through combat and movement, let's look at some of the other actions our pilgrims can perform during their turn. So the first one is a prey, and a pilgrim has to be on the same tile as a mystical box. They spend one action point and they may draw one fortune card from the fortune deck and add it to their hand. The next option we have is to meditate. So again, the pilgrim has to be on the same tile as a mystical box. They spend one action point and then they'll spin on the karma wheel. If they land on the white side, then they would draw three fortune cards and choose one. If they land on the black side, then they would choose one misfortune card and apply its effects. 
After that, then we have the open door option. So a pilgrim that's completely adjacent to an open door or to a door and facing it can may spend one action point to open it. Now keep in mind a pilgrim with two two space space has to be completely lined up with it. It can't be offset by either side. When they open it, they would just flip it over. The next option our pilgrims have is to rescue a villager. So as long as they're adjacent to a villager, they may spend one of their action points to rescue them. And when they do, they would receive three good karma points for doing so. After that, we have the recover, which as long as our hero is adjacent to a well, they may recover by spending one of their action points to drink from the well. When they do, they would recover all of their health, uh, their hit points up to the max. Now keep in mind that each pilgrim may only do this once per quest, so timing on this is important. The next option we have after that is to rest, and a pilgrim may spend one or both of their action points to do so. And when they do, they would recover five chi points for each point that they rest. After that, then we have collecting sutra. So a, a pilgrim that's adjacent to sutra may collect it for one action point. Keep in mind though that Trip is the only one that can actually use it to close demon gates and it also depends on, on the quest that you're playing. Some quests don't have Sutra, some quests have it but need you need to collect it and keep it and some quests have other conditions. Alright, the next action we're going to look at is Master Skill. So as you can see in this chart, as you accrue good karma and bad karma you can spend those to get different things. So. To spend one action point and four good karma, you would draw a single use skill card. If you t have ten good karma, you would spend that to get a brand new permanent skill card, and you would continue drawing until you get a new permanent card. When you accrue ten bad karma, you would immediately discard that and draw one corruption card and apply its effects, and you would up your weapon to the next level that it needs to go to. Right, so the last two actions can only be performed by trip. So when a hero receives enough dam damage to reduce their health to zero, they become unconscious and they'll be placed face down. To revive them, trip has to be next to them or in adjacent space to them, and he has to spend one of his action points, and he can spend between one and five of his health points and up to between one and five of his chi points to heal them. For every point that he spends, he will heal them one point. Now a couple things to keep in mind is that he doesn't have to spend any chi, but he has to have at least two hit points in order to spend one hit point. He cannot reduce his own health down to zero in order to revive another hero. And then the last action that Trip can perform is going to be dependent on, on the quest that you're playing. If Trip has a Sutra token and he happens to be adjacent to a gate, so he would sp discard his Sutra token and close the gate and flip it over. Alright, so now that we've covered all the actions that our pilgrims can perform, there's one other thing to note during a pilgrim's turn. They can play any skill cards that they have as long as they have any conditions that are required for those skill cards. A lot of the skill cards do not require action points, so the pilgrims can play those at any time, even not during their turn, and during other pilgrims' turns if they choose. And that ends the pilgrims' phase. Alright, so the third phase is the demon phase. And the demons, as you can see by the chart, are controlled by a core set of principles and rules. There, are, there is no player that controls the demons directly. All players can control the demons as they see fit. One thing to keep in mind is if there's any rule discrepancies, always side with the rule to make it harder for the pilgrims. So during the demon's turn, they are going to activate their models and spawn new models out of active demon gates. So the first thing we're going to go ahead and do is do a spawn. So we flip over the top card from the demon deck and it's going to give us two bull archers. So the archers are going to spawn adjacent to a gate and they're going to pick the points that are going to get them closest to Trip because he is their priority. He's the only one that can seal gates and he knows the rituals to, to close off the demon world so they're all trying to kill him. The rest of the companions are just basically along to support and protect him. 
So all the demon's main function is to go after him. All right, so when we activate demons, it works just like the pilgrims. The demons will activate with the one closest to trip, and each demon that activates will get two action points to spend during their turn to move and attack. So let's go ahead and put out their card. So for every action point they spend, they can move up to three spaces. So with our first demon, his range is three for his attack with his bow. So he's going to move up one space, which will put him into range. And then he's going to take a shot with his second action. So he gets two attack dice. So we're going to go ahead and roll those. And we roll four points. So then Trip is going to get to roll his two defensive dice. And he rolled zero on both of them. So he's going to take four points of damage. So we'll adjust his chart by four. So that puts him down to 10 health. And now with the second demon, there's no way we could move him three spaces and actually get a shot on trip. So the next thing he needs to do is to move towards him, but then he can target another pilgrim. So he's gonna move one, two, three for his movement. And then he's gonna be able to take one shot on the Monkey King because he has range to him. So he'll roll his two attack dice which he failed completely, so his attack misses and the Monkey King does not need the roll defense. And then all the demons have activated. The demons in the house will not activate until the heroes are inside the house. So the demon's turn is done. All right, so one other thing to note is that as you're spawning demons, if you run out of the demon type that you need to spawn, then as you can see in this chart, you're gonna spawn harder demons until you cannot spawn any demons. And that at that point, then you would put the demon card, demon rage card into effect. When the demon rage card is in effect, every demon that's on the table will get three action points instead of two action points to spend during their turn. And then during the maintenance phase of the following turn, this will get removed. And you would just go back to using the demon deck until you run into that situation again if there's too many demons out and you can't spawn anymore. All right, so the last phase in our turn is the end of turn phase. And in this phase, you're gonna go ahead and place uh, turn tokens on any of your condition cards that you may have. And if the quest requires you to track a uh, passage of time, then you can go ahead and adjust that during this phase as well. So, for example, in our quest that we're playing here, it says in the quest that at the end of turn phase, we're going to go ahead and remove one counter from our uh, villagers. So we'll remove that. And then we're ready to start the next turn.